Now we're going to discuss the period of the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted from 1803 until 1815. And I think the best way to do this is kind of go year by year, so that I can say, well, these events happened in 1803, etc., uh, and it will be a little bit easier. Um, in 1803, then, um, Great Britain had once again declared war on Napoleon, on the French, um, and he was, uh, or he, Great Britain was soon um, joined by other countries um, like Austria, um, like Sweden, and Russia, um, and eventually Prussia, um, all dedicated on finally defeating Napoleon and ending this uh, revolution. Um, during the year 1804, um, Napoleon decided it was time to make himself an emperor. Um, and he called for the Pope to be at his coronation ceremony with his wife, Josephine, who was to be crowned uh, his empress. Um, and there was a huge coronation. There's the um, uh, portrait of it you're seeing now. Um, and as the Pope was about to to crown Napoleon in in the in in this sort of um, style of Charlemagne uh, back from the year eight hundred, Napoleon took the crown out of the Pope's hand and crowned himself, which was a major statement, uh, and um, certainly um, something you would expect from someone who had such an ego as Napoleon. But by eighteen o four, then he was emperor of the French Empire. And um, he then uh, was basically set on ending, finally, um, these various countries from declaring war on him. And he did, by this time, it seemed he did want to have peace, um, but he knew he had to take care of these various um, enemies, um, or he would never have peace. Um, and that was quite true. By 1805, um, as I said, Britain was now um, joined with countries like Austria and Russia, and Napoleon, um, ha who had given up the idea of invading Great Britain, now turned his attention to an invasion uh, of continental Europe to finally take care of those pesky Austrians and hopefully um, the Russians at the same time. And he had amassed a huge army um, on the banks of, uh, of uh, the English Channel that had been preparing for an invasion of Great Britain. And they had been doing nothing but training and training and training, and they were ready for war. Um, and that's when Napoleon in 1805 uh, said, we're not going to do that invasion, but we're going to rather surprise the the um, allies uh, in the continent of Europe. Um, and so this very well-trained army, utilizing the core system we've talked about, uh, began moving um, towards engagements against the Austrians. Um, some amazing things happen in 1805, the first of which is when Napoleon um, is able, remember his, his core system, they're kind of like fingers and they can move around and they can, um, basically they can um, swoop around and encircle um, uh, armies uh, in certain case, cases and this was one of those cases. Uh, at the city of Ulm, which was like a fortress city, um, Napoleon's uh, soldiers were able to surround this city where the Austrians were held up and capture 60,000 Austrian soldiers with very little um, casualties. Um, that was more than half of the Austrian army. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and in, it was just an unbelievable, unprecedented uh, military achievement. Um, but much like his his achievements of uh, in the past in 1798 with uh, with taking Egypt, remember it was almost immediately that uh, Horatio Nelson led the British Navy to destroy the French uh, ships while they were docked. 
Well, this same sort of thing happened when Horatio Nelson engaged the French Navy at the Battle of Trafalgar, also in 1805, only days after Ulm, uh, and destroyed the entire French fleet, which meant Napoleon would never be able to control the seas, much less ever be able to invade Great Britain. That was a major hit to um, his empire. But he continued on his invasion, and six weeks after, uh, after uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, he met the combined forces. He unfortunately uh, was not able to divide and conquer in this in this case, although he had taken 60,000 of the enemy. Um, he met the Austrians and Russians uh, who had combined the Russians under Tsar Alexander I and the uh, Austrians who now only had half of their uh, army under uh, the Emperor Francis I at the Battle of Austerlitz, 1805, considered Napoleon's masterpiece on the battlefield. And using some of the psychological warfare um, tactics that we talked about, uh, he made it appear that he was weak, he made it appear that his, his center was weak, and he allowed the enemy to take the high ground, the so-called Pratts and Heights. Uh, and he used various techniques in order to bring the enemy in more in and in and into the center until he basically was able to um, surround them and begin annihilating them. Napoleon had roughly 70,000 troops matched against the Allies with 85,000, and he decisively beat the Austrians and Russians at the Battle of Austerlitz. And what led uh, in, then from that was a treaty. In 1806, the Treaty of Pressburg. Um, this gave uh, Napoleon lands in Italy uh, and Bavaria, and um, most importantly, perhaps, it all gave him the territories of the Holy Roman Empire, all of those German um, states. Um, and that Holy Roman Empire had been sort of a buffer zone between uh, Napoleon and the Allies. Now there was no buffer zone. And uh, he went on to to completely eradicate the Holy Roman Empire in 1806. It would never exist again. And he called it the Confederation of, of the Rhine under his, um, under his basically, um, empire. Um, that terrified the Austrians and Prussians, who now were on the front line against Napoleon. Um, and so, once again... Um, in 1806, Prussia, Russia, and Great Britain um, declared war on Napoleon. Um, Napoleon went on the offensive once again. He beat the Prussians um, in a decisive victory at two battles, the Battle of Jena and Auerstedt in 1806, and then defeat, defeated the Russians at the Battle of Friedland in 1807. Um, what he did then was he forced Prussia and, and, and Austria to become allies of his. Um, other countries like Sweden were also forced, and even Russia was forced to comply with his orders, although he did allow the Russian army um, to return to Russia, uh, which was sort of a, a sign of what he hoped would be a friendship between himself and Alexander I. Alexander I had other ideas, um, but this uh, this had ended with the so-called Treaty of Tilsit in 1807, in which, as I said, among those various things, uh, Russia had agreed to end their hostilities with Napoleon. But most importantly, they had agreed to Napoleon's continental system. This is where Napoleon recognized he was not going to be able to invade Great Britain, so what he was going to do was he was going to starve Great Britain. He was going to cut them off from all trade from Europe. And he needed all of those countries, whether he had conquered them or forced them to be allies, uh, to, um, to not trade with the British. Um, and the, the Russians agreed to this. But the continental system was disastrous for both all of Napoleon's allies, which were hurt just as much by it, Great Britain was hurt very much, but what you started to see was certain countries still 
either secretly or not so secretly, continued to trade with Britain, which meant that Britain really uh, never got to anything near starvation. And one of the countries that was continuing to do this was Russia. And Napoleon basically could not have that happen. Uh, he was going to have to send a force to Russia, as he felt, um, and make a statement by soundly defeating the Russians on the battlefield. And not he was not going to invade to conquer Russia, but rather to force them to comply with the continental system, to scare them into com compliance. Um, and so... Um, what you have, you know, basically during the, the period of 1807 until 1811 is Napoleon at the height of his power. He controls almost the entire continent of Europe in one way or another, with two exceptions. Uh, um, on one end uh, is the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Um, uh, Napoleon had, had invaded um, Spain in order to get to Portugal because the Portuguese um, were allies of the British and they were allowing the British to land possibly for an invasion. So they had to take care of them. But uh, in their invasion of, of Spain, the Spanish rose up against the French and began a guerrilla style, style warfare. Um, that is that, that the people rose up and began in, in uh, hit and run tactics killing French soldiers. To the point that in the end, a hundred, over a hundred thousand French soldiers would lose their lives in this um, what was known as the Peninsular War. Um, so Napoleon, his troops were held up there, uh, and then of course on the other end of Europe, Russia was not complying. He probably should have taken care of Spain uh, and the British and left the Russians alone, um, but he didn't. Uh, and so these uh, next events um, will um, be about Napoleon's downfall. Um, we'll get to a few of them here uh, and then the, the, uh, the last few in the next video. Um, so what were the particular events that led to Napoleon's downfall? Roughly the years 1808 to 1815, because 1808 was when he had become engaged with the Spanish and things got very out of control very quickly and he was losing that war. Um, and the British were ever incre increasingly able to move troops into Spain for a possible invasion uh, of France uh, from the West. So reasons for Napoleon's downfall, one was the continental system. Um, all of Europe, as I said, ended up hurting from the loss of trade with the British and Spain and Russia continued to illegally trade. Um, and so it was something that Napoleon forced on his so-called allies um, that they were not simply going to take because it was hurting them. Uh, the second thing is this Peninsular War in Spain, um, which led to these uprisings, something that Napoleon just simply could not take care of, especially when he was eyeing Russia. So the third thing, and perhaps the biggest, is that in 1812, Napoleon amassed an, an army called the Grand Armée, made up of not just his French soldiers, um, but soldiers conscripted from all throughout his empire of an army of 600,000 soldiers, the largest that had ever been formed in, in European history. Um, in order, once again, to invade Russia, beat them on the battlefield, force them to comply, and come back home. Um, but things don't turn out that way. Um, I have uh, uploaded a video on the disaster of Napoleon's invasion of Russia um, below this video. Um, please watch it. Um, some questions on the uh, exam will come from this video, two or three. Um, and it, it's, it gives you such a, a clear picture of how disastrous this invasion was. So just generally, um, these 600,000 troops invaded Russia. They could not get the Russians to engage them in a fight. The Russians kept retreating, retreating, and also used a scorched earth policy, burning everything uh, so the French had nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep, uh, or certainly in a shelter or anything. Um, and by the time they reached Moscow, winter had set in. And if
Now, anything about the Russian winter, you know it can get as low as negative 40 degrees. So they Napoleon had no choice but to retreat from Moscow, and the men um, froze to death uh, on the march back. The 600,000 that went in, uh, less than 50,000 made it back.